And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is taught, it will be taught. When you come back, you can become a prophet. One of the ways God reached out to humanity is by raising vessels that can bear the witness of his reality. Most times, God does not appear from Zion. When a dimension of God wants to appear, what he does is that he raises a man and he invests that dimension of his reality. So when you make contact with that man, you touch the very texture of God. Paul came and said, follow me as I follow Christ. If you see me and you interact with me long enough, you will touch God. So when a man is made, what happens is that he becomes a theater that manifests the dimensions of God. You are not a Christian because you can receive bread and wine from God. You are a Christian because you are supposed to be the revelation of God to your generation. You are not blessed because you receive the car. You are blessed because you are a manufacturer of everything God has to offer to your generation. Can you ask the Lord this morning, make me, 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 make me. You may be prospering, but there is darkness in your family. Meanwhile, you are the priest. You are the deliverer. Tell the Lord, make me this morning. Make me this morning. The making of man is the greatest dimension of blessing that Zion has to offer. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. I saw the vision. He said to make every member of the church, every member, it's not the pastors, it's not the shepherd, it's not the deacon. Every member of the church should become a carrier of God. Tell the Lord to make you this morning. That's when you will be truly blessed. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. You know, because of the investment of prayer and revelation on this ground, the atmosphere is always volatile. As I speak to you now, the hand of God is already moving. The heavens, the heavens are beginning to open. The dew of the glory of God is already beginning to descend. We have not opened the scripture, but the ground is a fertile ground. It says, take off thy shoes, for where you are standing is holy ground. There are places you enter, nothing is done, but the heart of God is there. The Bible says, so long as Samuel lived, the heart of God was perpetually against the Philistines. There are men that start in territories, and that place becomes the borders of heaven. Most of you are already receiving impartations. The visitations of heaven. It comes to you like a rushing mighty wind. Kaya. Salita matre kavas. Shetetetesh. 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 Paratataya tata. Obra satata. That the chariots of heaven may overtake you like a soup. That you may be carried in the wet winds of fire. Into your destiny. In the name of Jesus. Just stay calm where you are. If you can't, stop praying. Stop praying. There are three persons here that light, light, literal light will appear to you now. You will see it like lightning. Something is about to happen. You are about to catch a flight into the writings of your ordination. The things that God wrote concerning you before the foundations of the world. They are going to travel before you now like light. When Moses went to receive the law on the mountain, he said he saw the finger of God and a flame of fire went out of his finger and wrote the commandment. Light is about to appear to somebody. Oh, Shatire! That it may be performed according to the counsel of your will. Say, Lord, the career tanas, paradatas, selai te capelos, bratatas, bratatas. Thank you, Father. Like rain, let it fall. Let it fall. I can see it. 
I'm seeing some wise young women that are about to rise. See, there's a fire. I see these ones burning with fire. And their tongue is about to judge. Not just iniquity, but the powers of witchcraft. The powers of witchcraft. I see people burning with flames of fire. And so Holy Spirit, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, even to the, the minister's stand. No, the ones that you are putting fire upon, the ones you are putting fire upon, Lord Jesus, touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Flames of fire. Coming into fraternity with the seraphims of glory. By the time I'm rounding up, listen, something will happen to you. The turbine of your spirit will be activated. Most of you will become mobile prayer machines. The things you struggled with, a revival will begin in your spirit. You will pray on anything. The chaff of iniquity, the debris of dark installation, you will burn it off by fire. It's time for the armies of Zion to arise. The Mambri tree is already shaking. The spirit of God have gone ahead. The angelic host have moved. The armies on earth was arise. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In the precious name of Jesus. Please be seated. Be seated for... Let me share the word of God for 30 minutes. And then we will we'll pray for another 10 minutes. When we look upon the pages of scriptures, God, God was manifested. In several dimensions. He revealed himself to humankind. Through several dimensions of his essence and his reality. Some of you will live here today. And you will become another man. <laughs> I want to share with you what I call the pathway of ordination. And as I share this, you will see the story of your life in what I'm sharing. Because the things I'm about to share to you, they are cast on iron. They cannot be uttered. It's like the laws of the Medes and the patients that cannot be uttered. They are cast on iron. If you must fulfill destiny, you must follow this pathway. It's a trajectory of life and relevance. Everybody that amounted to anything in God, this is the path that they followed. Meanwhile, it's important for me to quickly let you know that God decided to give different callings to men, not because one is superior to the other. But it's because God expects that a complete work be done. If you want to know why the callings are different, then you need to understand the purpose for which it was given. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, the Bible said to some he gave to be apostles. To some he gave to be prophets. To some he gave to be evangelists. To some he gave to be pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So the reason for the ordinations in the fivefold is so that the believer can come to maturity. It is not because the apostolic office is superior to the pastoral office. But every one of them have specific assignments to carry out in order to bring the body to completeness. 
I said that to say this. The things I'm about to share this morning, they don't in any way invalidate the teachings that you have received before now. But for you to be whole, you must combine everything together so the body of truth can be complete and you can grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. By ordination, the evangelist cannot but have one kind of sight. The evangelists have what we call the hindsight. No matter how he tries, every time he looks at the scripture, he takes you back to the cross. The evangelist doesn't take you forward. He takes you back because you cannot live in the future unless you are traced back to the past. The root of your life is in your past. But the manifestation of your reality is in the future. So every time you meet an evangelist, he takes you back to the cross. Because without the cross, everything you are doing is old creation. And it cannot pass the veils of immortality. So in order for a man to have a place with God, his foundation must be traced to his backward. The cross. This is why the evangelist teaches about the cross, about salvation. Not because that's all he knows. But according to his wiring, everything that comes out of him, Causes him to bring men back to a place where they can redefine their reality with God. The prophet gives foresight. So every time you interact with a prophet, he tells you what to do to succeed, how to move and take the next step of your life. No matter how the prophet tries, he cannot correctly enumerate salvation until somebody grows to maturity. That is why most prophetic ministry. That thing is all about the prophetic. You, the, the most babes in the body of Christ. Because they think everything is about word of knowledge. They think everything is about word of wisdom. They think everything is about discernment of spirit. They don't understand that as newborn babes, you must desire the sincere milk of the word of God so that you may grow thereby. So people come every day is word of knowledge. So at the end of the day, they can receive so much from God, but they are babes. They are not relevant in the equation of God. Peter came in First Peter 2 verse 2. He said, as newborn babes. And when Paul came in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, he said, whoever taketh meek is a babe and is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He said, but strong meat belong to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil. So, even though the pastor is teaching, that's why the Bible says pastors and teachers. Because there is a point where you are giving the basics of, found, of salvation. There is another point where you are giving strong meat. That time you need a teacher. Because the teacher has insight. The evangelists have hindsight. The prophet has foresight. But the teacher has insight. He knows what to give you so that your muscles can be strong and your bones can bear weight. Because if you only have milk, Paul said you are a babe. You are unskilled in the world of righteousness. And the calamity of a babe is too. The first one is that so long as you are a babe, you can never have inheritance in the kingdom. In Galatians 4 verse 1, he said the heir, so long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, even though he be Lord of all. Therefore, the father places him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The second calamity of a babe is that he will be covered in the day of war. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 18, he says, Rachel was found crying for her children because they were not. The first casualty in the days of war are children. So you must of necessity be open to the ministry of a teacher so that he teaches you how to do business with strong meat because strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern Without discernment, a generation can be lost. I told them in Port a few weeks ago, a whole generation, only three men were relevant with God. Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. The guys were reciting the laws, the Torah, and they became political men. So they had two high priests. One of them was carrying religious oblation. The other one was relating with the governors. And when Jesus showed up walking bodily in the territory, no one could recognize him because there was no discernment. Only two, three people knew the Messiah. Meanwhile, the prophecy is what they were living for. The Bible spoke of Anna, the prophetess. He said, since her husband died, she was in the synagogue for 80 and 4 years and she was fasting and praying. So when Jesus showed up, she knew that this is the salvation of Israel. 
The Bible spoke of Simeon. He said Simeon was praying. When they brought the baby, the infant Jesus to the temple, he said Simeon went by the spirit. Nobody was telling him what to do. That's a man of discernment. He was praying. The heavens changed. The energy changed. The balances were altered. He knew that the prophecy is about to be fulfilled. So he began to look. Where is it? And he saw a light. He walked. When he saw the infant Jesus, he said this is the salvation of Israel. At the age of eight, how were you able to know by what integer did you discern that this little babe is the salvation that was being waited for for 700 years? Discernment. John, the Bible said in Luke 1 80, was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. And when he came out, he saw Jesus coming. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, how did you know this guy was your cousin? You were with him all the time. At some point, when he was separated, discernment began to come. So when he saw Jesus, he didn't see his cousin. He saw the Messiah. So the Bible says, strong meat, it belongs to them who by reason of youth have exercised their senses to discern. It is a teacher that will give you the equipping for discernment. And then we have the ministry of the apostle. The apostle have what we call long sight. Every time an apostle talks to you, he cannot help it. He wants to establish Jesus as the cornerstone of your life. So apostles talk about government. We talk about kingdom. We talk about eternity. Your life has no reference unless it can be traced to a spot in eternity future. Jesus said, when they appear, he shall give them white stones. You know what a stone is? A stone is not a block. A stone is part of the infrastructure of the new Jerusalem. But before you become a stone, you must live a life in this world that God has the liberty to chisel you so that you can fit into the corners where your destiny is relevant. You see this building, there are many blocks. All of them were created the same. But when the building was about to be erected, some were divided in the middle. Because for you to fit into the corner, you must be divided. That's where government comes. For you to be a foundation, you must be toughened. For you to be a deadly tear, you must be toughened. So, apostles begin to teach you the significance of your dealings. So, you understand why every time there's calamity, it's about you. Every time there's accusation, it's about you. Your second name is Dryas. What is happening to you is that your block is being taken. Because in Zion, you are foundation. Another person can be another part of the block. But you, in Zion, you are foundation. You can come to church and every time it's complaining about your character. You cut this off. You cut this off. You are a cornerstone. With that oblong dimension, you can't fit into the building. The office of the apostle brings you into relevance in eternity future. That's why we talk dealing. That's why we talk kingdom. That's why we talk government. And the message of the apostle is not necessarily captured in the Bible. It is revealed in his dealings. Because himself will be chiseled by God. And when he becomes a dry stone, that time he can bear a kind of witness that is not among men. And that is why every time God wants to even shift dispensation, the only people that have the credentials to bring the church to another dispensation are apostles. By reason of their dealing, they sustain the flexibility to carry the church from one level to another. When they are doing that, the whole world will persecute them. But they don't care. They have become dead men. An apostle can get up and tell you, that God said this time is reviver. You can accuse him. You can insult him. It doesn't matter. That's a dead man talking. The life that he lives now is no longer his. It is the life of the son of God that gave himself for him. The reason is because he has stepped everything beyond the borderlines of creation. And he has found out that we are the circumcision. That worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Having no confidence. So it doesn't matter. See, your own breakthrough can be a car. The breakthrough for an apostle is his ability to receive the signals of heaven. Because the responsibility of his life is to bring the church from one level of encounter to another. From one level of dealing to another. From one dispensation of glory to another. But if you listen to only an apostle, you may destroy your life. Because you who is supposed to be a politician, you can pack your load and go and live at the cave. Eternity, you are the spirit of ocean. You are glorious beyond this creature. Eternity, you are the spirit of ocean. 
sobre esta vida rajida parasca sobre la taradis paradiana sabrata into pacaradis retetenes contra la tía palakizo sondro paradada rastina tapada tiasto ome crasivo calianda akira zuzo calrasito ome le ketai ome le ketai ome le ketai I spoke in tongues because I saw a young man that has a full hair and somehow I saw oil dripping from your head oil oh, yeah. oil oh, yeah. dripping from his head that means this one I speak about he has an apostolic calling so as I began to speak about the office of the apostle his oil oh, yeah, began to move because what I was doing was that I was putting fire on the oil oh, yeah, that was concealed and right now everybody that has an apostolic DNA here I speak by the spirit of God I say let the anointing be concentrated upon you. Holy Spirit, touch them. Saletesh, karatatas, fariana padesk, brazilo frakatian da sibras. I saw a young man with full hair. Find that one for me. The pathway of ordination. The pathway. Say captain. Catalana track. It is not healthy to only listen to an apostle. Hi. See, see, see. There is fire. I'm seeing fire. They are sprinkling fire. They are sprinkling fire. They are sprinkling fire. I'm seeing some strange sight in the spirit. They are sprinkling fire on people. Somebody is about to begin to dance a strange kind of dance. You can't control your body. You are being launched into the angelic realm. I see light coming upon somebody. You will lose coordination now. As I speak, let that dimension come upon you. Salataita, Ferakidos, Katatas, Beratatata, Radatatas, Kapaya. Hey, hey, hey. I call for that dimension. I call for that dimension. I call it for. I call it for. Listen, the waters have been stirred. I saw a vision just now. A young lady, I saw you. You carried your mother in the spirit and you threw her into the water. So what's happening now is that you are standing in for your mother. And I see a condition that has to do with the kidney. And right now as I speak by the spirit, I command, let your anointing travel in the direction of your mother. And let affliction be tamed. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I make it happen. I make it happen. I make it happen. Sarabandra Parash. Zetetenesh. Rakido Seriata. Paradantra Kabash. Kabash, 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 Kabash. Many things are already happening. Somebody on the right hand side here, listen. I just saw somebody handed over a khaki to a young lady. And as I speak, I release the anointing in that direction. Father, the one who is implicated, I release it in the name of Jesus. Rakavondre Paraski Bosch. Saila Telino Rahaski Branda Kalataski Pranika Zindra Patatiska Zovrendre Tadadido Sandre Kila Paradiasto Ratete Shetar Rakila Pariska Paridosko 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 Listen Listen There are three of you here that have a prophetic destiny Your ears are popping open in the spirit The people I speak about You have been feeling sensations you don't know what it means. But as I spoke in tongues, what I did was to create an activation. Kelasino, Garianda Finasca, Lepretira Sarianda Paras, Ragatiras, Maranda Sebretagos, Delegatina Sagatias, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Savas. I'm seeing, I'm 
seen in the spirit. There's somebody that has pain on your right knee. I just said something like a pain on your right knee. As if it's about to even swear. As I speak right now, I challenge that darkness. That chain that is clogged around your knee. Break in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah. Sigh, sigh, sigh. Hey. There's somebody on the left side of this hall. You are feeling a pain and an itching sensation. Somewhere in your right eye. You are the one. It's living now. Shatetesh. Terekate. Parina, parina. Parina, parina. Right now, I release the anointing. I challenge that operation of darkness out of him in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I've seen a vision. I've seen a vision. I've seen a young man that is bearded. And I saw you knelt down three days ago. And you are praying to God for the supernatural. You say, oh, but it's not you. I know you. <laughs> you are telling the Lord, I'm tired of sensation. I want something tangible. Run out. You are about to be commissioned. Seterina Katarito. Shele, Shele. Shele. Shele, Tatina. Lift your hand, brother. As I minister to him, it will touch everybody that is implicated. Right now, Holy Spirit of God, Telete Tatalita, what he desires, I don't only release it upon him. You sent your word to Jacob, enlightened upon Israel. Holy Spirit, take! He spreads right now. Every one of you, take in the name of Jesus. Take in the name of Jesus. Katerina, Bradonzo break the vadis. Chaya Tarata. Tatara. Mandoria Takazizas. Tazizo Senera Tekaish. Touch Lord. I'm seeing somebody on this middle row. You have something under your right leg, like a blister. And it's causing you pain under your right leg. The Lord is telling things. He's telling things. Thank you, Father. You may be seated. Sit down, sit down. See, you don't know the effect of your intercession, your commitment, and your revelation. The heavens over you are open. The evangelists have hindsight. So he takes you back to the cross. That's where you begin your journey from. The prophet has foresight. So he gives you day-to-day direction. That's why his kids are words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discernment of spirit. The teacher has insight. That's why he gives you strong wit. And by then, your senses can be exercised. The apostle has long sight. Remember, long sight means outside the context. So he takes you beyond earth into eternity. But the pastor has oversight. So it's the pastor that will tell you everything that every other person should tell you so that there is balance in your life. Sometimes you come to church, the pastor is telling you, read your books. You think he's carnal. You think he's not a spiritual person. Without him, you will destroy yourself. The pastor is the one that tells you how to take your job seriously. He tells you about the diligence and the excellency of labor. Sometimes he co- catch that sister so she doesn't enjoy herself. They are angelic operations. Sometimes the pastor can come to church and through other days teaching you about dressing and etiquette. You say this guy is not spiritual. What kind of thing is that? You don't know where God is taking you. Your ministry may be before kings, but you will not have the earth the courtesy to operate at that level. The pastor can show up and teach you how you need to relate with family. You think it's uh, about uh, I saw an angel. When you get married, after three months with your anointing, your family will scatter. So for God to give you the blueprint of your destiny and to carry you through the pathway of ordination, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher must speak into your life. The reason your pastor sent me to come here is because you need an apostolic investment. 
It's not because what he's teaching you is not as spiritual as what I'm teaching. It's about balance, maturity, and stability. The final phase of my training was on this same campus in this same church. I had been trained by virtually every office, but God brought me to my friend. And for one year, eight months, I was an usher here. That's not Bible study. We call that one the Z coordinate. The first time I showed up, I said, what is the meaning of this? For God's sake, I'm a master's degree holder. This young man is still in the school. That pride element is why I would not have been where I am today. So God used him to chisel me. If Apostle Warume told me to be an usher, I would say, thank you, Jesus. But he brought me to Reverend Hughes. Because I will see Apostle up there. And by pride and arrogance, I will see Reverend Hughes down here. My eye was defective. I did not have the eye of honor. And meanwhile, one of the greatest precursors of impartation and spiritual reception is the Isle of Honor. So God brought me here. I was an usher for one year, eight months. It was when that phase of training was rounding up that everything began to speed up in my life. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Selegrum dar faktira abadask. Lido vra hasgilo vra angla gazido kranda faradiga sastish. Baranda sundre kadiaska. Kaliska dija la astra batondre katadidos. It's not everything you receive cognitively. Certain things are transferred to you as a body or spirit. And some other things are chiseled into you through process and delay. I received a kind of education I have not received anywhere. That's when pride died. I say I'm a master's degree holder. This guy is an undergraduate. The Holy Ghost say, in the question of heaven, we don't have certificate there. <laughs> Bachelor's degree is not in heaven. So the parameter you are judging by, we don't recognize it in heaven. I say these guys are on campus. I'm a graduate. He say, yes, uh, this kind of university is not in heaven. The one we have in heaven is called the school of the spirit. <laughs> and he has no regard for earthly jurisdictions and parameters. So I stayed until after eight months. It became normal for me to carry the offering basket. I will even be doing it and having fun. I didn't notice I was an usher anymore. I found myself in a company of wise men. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. They are the instructors that God gives you alongside the Holy Spirit in order for you to fulfill eternal ordination. We don't have time, so I will just run through the pathway of ordination quickly. The first thing on the path of ordination is what we call the betting of vision. The betting of vision. You can be on head and live for 80 years and then when you are in church because you have been there for 35 years or for 60 years out of respect they can obey you as an elder. If you have no vision you are obeyed. With all humility. I'm saying this with the backings of scriptures, not arrogance. The Bible said Moses was in Egypt. He was 40 years old. But as far as heaven's calendar was concerned, Moses was a child. The moment Moses sustained body for ordination, instantly the Bible said, when Moses was come of age, that was at the age of 40. <laughs> so Moses came of age at the age of 40. He said, when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasure that was in Egypt, which is but for a city. Why? Because he saw him that was invincible. Meanwhile, at the age of 17, Timothy saw vision. So Paul made him the bishop of Ephesus. So the time you come of age in the spirit is when the vision of your destiny is born. A man who has not bettered the reason for which he is born will be a child at the age of 99. So you can't walk on the corridor of ordination unless you bet your vision. The moment your vision is bettered, it begins to create laws to govern your life. The day you know that you are a prophet, 
that day it will become a taboo for you to sleep through the night. It will become a taboo for you to eat from Monday to Sunday. The reason is not because it's doctrine. Your vision now begins to set a law upon your heart. And on the strength of that law, you can become relevant in time and in eternity. So when you see people living a strange kind of life, it is not because their lifestyle is the blueprint for everybody. It's because they have found their own vision. And on the strength of that which they found, a new government was established upon their lives. The Bible spoke about John. He was born to the family of a priest. And on the strength of that, he was supposed to become a priest. But suddenly, something happened to him and he realized that he was a prophet. So in Luke 180, the Bible said John was in the wilderness. Not because if you don't want to be a priest, go and live in the wilderness. When he saw the vision, that was the place where his training was. So that place, even though he was living on wild honey and locusts, dressed in camel skin, that place became a waterbed for him. Because for him to be able to track the dimensions of heaven that was coming to his heart as a vision, he must be schooled. And he was there, the Bible said, until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Meanwhile, Jeremiah was also a prophet. And he was born to the family of a priest. Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5. He didn't know. So he was following his father and doing the priestly oblation until vision appeared to him from heaven. And the day vision came, his lifestyle changed. He said, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I ordained you to be a prophet. That means, even though it is right to obey your father, and you are going in the direction of priesthood, and there is nothing wrong with it, this one is not consistent to the handwriting of ordination. You will walk here for 90 years. When you come to Zion, there will be no blocks to build your portion of Zion. I didn't send you to earth, as Apostle Aramai will tell us, to be creative. I sent you to be yielded. The creative one is the Holy Ghost. So, you become creative to the degree that you are yielded. Every time a man is rebellious, what he's doing can be a mighty invention, but it's not creativity. What is the vision that God has put in your heart? You can be part of an assembly like this, and God give you a vision in the vision. So, when you are serving as an usher, you are not serving because pastor put you there. The reason many people are rebellious is because they think what they are doing is pastor's job. They have no vision. When you know that that is what God wants you to do in order for the service to be complete, you will be doing it with dignity like the guy on the microphone. Because he is playing his part, you are playing your part. God does not reward us because we are on the mic. God rewards us because we fulfill our quota of the work in Zion. That's why I say woe unto him who is at ease in Zion. You are not rewarded because you are the one preaching. You can be scrubbing the table, but you have the highest reward because you did your own 100%. Meanwhile, the guy who is preaching can be in, 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 in the football match yesterday. Hey! Hey! And then his club loses. And he comes home, he's angry till morning. So he came and carried Bible and came and preached haphazardly. Meanwhile, you prayed in tongues and came and you cleaned the chairs. You received the reward more than the pastor that morning. You were mighty on your throne. You reign, you reign, you reign, you reign, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. So the first thing vision does for you is that it defines your essence. It is vision that defines your essence. I'm not doing what I'm doing because I love it so much. I was told that I'm an apostle to the nations. This is why even though try I come now, I don't have a choice. At this point, I cannot say I'm not doing it again. It's an error. I saw something that has defined my essence. So the Bible says, whoever lays his hand on the plow and turns back is not fit for the master's job. All of us will come to church. Five of us will be fair. But we will not be defined because we are beautiful. And we will not marry because we are beautiful. The reason you will marry a banker, another one will marry a prophet, another one will marry a politician is vision. It defines your essence. So Jeremiah was going in the direction of priesthood, but vision told him, you are a prophet. He may be at the age of 30, I don't know, but whatever age it was that he was in at the time, was no longer relevant what he was doing. The moment he realized, it became an error for him to be a priest. Visions will define your essence. The second thing that vision will do for you, is that he will ensure that your life must be spiritual. 
If you see a man who is carnal, he has no vision. Vision will force you to be a spiritual man. Because you cannot create vision in your head. The only way you see vision is that the patterns on the mount must be revealed to you. So he said to Moses in Exodus 25 verse 9 and verse 40. He said, ensure that you build according to the pattern that is on the mount. So the creating of the tabernacle was not a function of Moses' creativity. He would have built hundred of them, it would be wrong. So everything you do becomes spiritual to the degree that it is captured within the confines of your vision. The borderline of your vision is the scope of your spirituality. Because it is vision that forms the boundary of your spirituality. Noah was living in the fear of God all his life. But the Bible did not recognize him. Until the Bible said, when God spoke to Noah, Noah moved with reverence. There were many other things Noah was doing. But the quality of his spirituality was defined by his reverence. Because reverence was the infrastructure upon which the betting of his vision stood on. Noah may be a very skillful man. Noah may be a worshiper. We didn't capture that. He said, when God spake, Noah moved by reverence. It was on the strength of reverence that his vision was born. So reverence became the heaviest molecule of Noah's spirituality. And the only way Noah could achieve the feat that he achieved was because what? It was revealed to him. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, from verse 11 to verse 18, you will see how God was telling him to make the ark of a gopher wood. Nothing Noah did was because he was a technocrat. Everything he did was because he saw it. The way you preach what you preach, the way you serve how you serve, all of them is a function of the vision that you saw. If you don't have a vision, it will be difficult to be spiritual. Because it will determine the direction that you should go. You can be singing because you are skillful. Your voice will not pierce through Zion. You see, this is why most times before we come to sin, we wear high heel like this. Now, there's nothing wrong. The Bible says, make garments unto Aaron for beauty and for glory. But if that becomes your priority, it's because you have no vision. Meanwhile, another worshiper comes to sing and he knows because when the blueprint of his destiny was given to him, God told him, every time you sing, I will baptize people in the Holy Ghost. So what he sees is not his dress. What he sees is whether people will be what? Baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because the reason he's singing is for baptism in the Holy Ghost to be possible. God may tell him, every time you sing, I will heal the sick. So he will not judge his, his worship that day by the quality of his voice. He will judge his worship that day by the testimonies that emanate from that worship. So every time he worships, he's waiting to see whether somebody went to him and said, God told me. Then he knows I'm the one. The pastor can come and say, yes, you know, if you're in this church, you will move in word of knowledge. He's a lie. The person singing is the one with the key. So your spirituality is now defined by the degree to which you align with your vision. When you see a carnal man, there's no vision. Vision also ensures that whatever you do in time is secured eternally. So eternal security is born out of vision. See, Jesus was with the disciples for many years. His goal was to bring salvation and to build the church so that through that umbrella of the church, the purposes of God can be fulfilled. But there was no way Jesus could, could bet the church. He carried them from one location to another. He preached this gospel. He took them to the mountain. They could do it. Until the day that somebody saw flashes from heaven. They now say, who do men say, I, the son of man, I am. And that day, somebody caught a vision. So with the whole preaching of Jesus on the mountain, in the cave, in the house, they tore the roof. He could not bet the church. Because Jesus knows that if something is not born from the spirit, the devil can corrupt it in time. If Jesus came and told them about the church and they built it, the devil would have compromised it. The reason the gates of hell shall not prevail against it is not because the apostles are strong. It's because upon this revelation that came from the Father. So the foundation was in heaven. So when Paul was trying to destroy the church, he said it is hard to kick against the bricks. What you are fighting against has its root in heaven. So God can tell you you are a businesswoman. Even if it's pure water, you will be a millionaire. The whole witches in your village can gather and say it will not work. They are joking. That thing you are doing has its root in heaven. 
If you want to destroy that thing, travel to heaven and destroy it. Because until the foundation be shaken, the righteous has something to do. <laughs> until the foundation be destroyed, the righteous has something to do. The only time you can deal with the righteous is when you destroy the foundation. So God makes sure a man does not begin to live until he first of all catches a sight in heaven. That's why even the tabernacle will say, build according to the pattern. So till tomorrow, till tomorrow, every time anything is caught in heaven, there's no way you can destroy it in time. That's why even men of purpose, you can't kill them. The Bible said they came, they carried Jesus, they took him to the cliff of the mountain. When they reached the cliff and they saw, they have exercised all their power. The Bible said Jesus walked in between them. See, that time, that's when you compose yourself. When they brought him to the cliff, he now stood like this. And as he turned, his purpose paused time. Because you can't kill him. He said, this commandment have I learned of the Father. I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. You don't kill them. What is powering them has its root in eternity. The power of vision. When you catch a vision and you know it, then you are willing to give up everything for it to be fulfilled. Because you know your relevance is not a function of how you look. Your relevance is a function of how your vision looks. Your vision is the beautiful one, not you. Have you seen men of God? Some of them are talking like this. Hey, Lord Jesus is good. Meanwhile, people want to touch them. Some will cut their body and carry it to the house. You don't love that man. His vision is beautiful. So it overshadows his ugliness. Meanwhile, people that have no vision, they spend all their money trying to look good. That is because they've not seen anything in Zion. A man of vision can stroll here with slippers and jeans and shirt. And everybody, hey, 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 what are you looking? You don't, I tell you, if his twin brother comes that look exactly like him, you will not like him. So what you are admiring is not the man, it's the glory of his vision. This is what Lucifer did not understand. Lucifer was in heaven. He thought that his beauty was about him. He didn't know that his beauty was the quality of service that he was rendering in heaven. The Bible said concerning Lucifer, he said, Thou that sealeth the psalm. In Ezekiel 28, from verse 12, he said, Thou that sealeth the psalm. That means, if you study it in the Message Bible, he said, Lucifer was the compendium of wisdom and beauty. So everything about beauty in the world that were created before the new earth was created, beauty and wisdom were articulated within the borders of Lucifer's constitution. So if you wanted to know the wisdom of God, approach Lucifer, it emits like radiation. If you wanted to see the beauty of God, approach Lucifer, it emits like radiation. Meanwhile, he didn't know that his beauty was not because he was beautiful externally. His beauty was the kind of service he was rendering in heaven. The Bible said, from the day of thy creation, thy taps and thy tablets were indeed. So the glory is not how the, the, the organ was created in his body. The glory is that he was the governor of worship in heaven. If he fails to bring worship to heaven, the look become useless. He said he was covered with ten precious stones. And everything you and I call jewelry today is what Lucifer wore as his garment. You know he's a spirit. But Lucifer was also the governor of the earth realm. So he needed to be clothed with things that can make him walk on earth. The first earth that was destroyed. So he was covered with stones. You could look at Lucifer and you see diamond. You see sapphire. If he turns like this, you see gold. So the guy thought it was about beauty. The Bible said you were in Eden from the day of thy creation. The anointed cherub that covered it. He said you moved to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. That means Lucifer was at the same time a cherubim and a seraphim. Because it is the cherubims that cover the glory of God. It is the seraphim that preserve the holiness of God. And the only way the seraphim is able to preserve the holiness of God is that it moved to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. So the fire purifies him. Suddenly he felt it was important because it was beautiful. And when he wanted to ascend his throne, he said iniquity was found in you. So he was cast from the mountain of God. He lost service and instantly See, tomorrow the Bible said Lucifer can appear as an angel of light, but is no longer beautiful. Relevance has been taken away because he lost sight of vision. His duty in heaven was to serve God. He was the governor of sound. 
He was the governor of light because he was called the light bearer. He was the custodian of beauty and, and, and wisdom. He was the governor of the first earth. But he lost everything because he lost sight of vision. The reason most of us become proud is because we think we are beautiful. But well, don't worry. I thank God that here you are trained and discipled well. Have you seen young ladies that were Miss Beauty? They are walking like this until they become 38 years old. So their arrogance make them disdain men. If you look at them, they are like angels. But when you come close, their arrogance will dance see you away from them. So they walk like this until they are 38 years old. Then they come to church and attend every VG. Lord, take me as I am. <laughs> you reign, you reign, you reign. So Paul discerned them correctly. He said, let the beauty, let your beauty, let your beauty not be in your modest apparel. Be in your modest apparel rather. Not in your flamboyance. He said, like Sarah, call your husband Lord. The way Sarah called Abraham Lord. It is true that your beauty, that even if your, father, your husband is an unbeliever, you can convert him. That means your vision and expression can be more potent than the gospel you preach. But that, that opportunity was only given to women. You can convert your unbeliever husband because you have caught a vision. People don't understand. The pathway of ordination, it begins with vision. How much of your vision have you apprehended? You don't come to church because they follow you up. The pastor can even decide to say, go, I don't need you anymore. You will kneel down and beg. Not because you don't have anything to do, but you have seen something. Arrogance. They can say, go, we don't need you again. You will beg. Because in this world, you don't do things because you can do them. You do things because you should do them. And the things you should do are only within the boundary of your vision. So you can come and say, no, I'm an apostle. Even if it doesn't want, I can start my church. It will work. You can have a church of 100,000 people. Heaven don't know it. Jesus told them in Ephesus, the reason for which the church was planted was lost. He said, I come quickly and I'm coming to remove your candlestick. So you can be doing activity on earth, but there's no candle in heaven. You can be an apostle. You are going everywhere. And then they say, no, go. They separate you from where God planted you. And then you now say, for what? what? And then they preach for me. And then, and then you go. You will preach like that for 90 years. When you go to heaven, your radar stopped reading the day you departed from where you were planted. This is why we don't move until we have seen. We don't move because we can move. We move because we should move. Our strength, our value is to the degree that we are consistent with heaven. Elohim Adonai Oh! I have five more minutes. It's a body. When you carefully and accurately articulate your vision, then the next pathway is open to you. It's called the path of process. <laughs> I always share this story. Don't laugh. I know you have heard it a couple of times. My friend came to me and he said, Jesus appeared to me and said, I'm the apostle Paul of this generation. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Will you doubt the voice of God? And Jesus would have even appeared to him. But you will never become until you follow the path of process. Paul the apostle saw Jesus. He said, when it pleased the Father to reveal the Son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I went to Arabia. It was in Arabia that his tools were given to him. He had seen Jesus, but he didn't jump to preach because he saw Jesus. Have you seen people that travel to heaven and the next thing it becomes their gospel? <laughs> The guy is talking about hey, hell is real. But the next five seconds where you see him is a depiction of hell. Some people are telling you give your heart to Christ. You give your heart to Christ. They are the same people that will rape you. They believe what they are preaching but there was no process. So God was not installed into them like an operating system. They talk by gift. They operate by gift but there is no process. The beauty of a man in the dispense of the counsel of God is the extent to which he obeys process. This is why glory is revealed to the degree of death. 
A man can never manifest glory unless he dies to flesh. And it is in the altar of process that flesh is dealt with. So what process does is that it ensures that the manifestation of your vision conforms with the dictates of heaven. Because God can call you a prophet, but you can come on earth and become an apostle. God can call you a teacher, but you can come on earth and become an evangelist. Because when you check, you are still preaching, but when you check, it's like the evangelical ministry, there's more money and honor there. You were teaching in one small location for five years. Then one day you escorted your friend for a meeting. And then when you came to the airport, a seven-year-old lady brought flour. And then when they collected the flour, you are going your normal way. You think you want to stroll to the meeting. You now see four messages jeeps. And then dirty protocol stand with black suit. They open it. Usher you people inside. And they are moving with double traffic. And as you reach the meeting, they open the, they pack, the way they even park for five years. You will not forget. <laughs> And then as we were coming down, the guy on the stage is announcing, the moment we are waiting for is finally here. Evangelist has come. Then you now went to me and say, Lord, why did you make me a teacher? And then you wake up and say, I am an evangelist in the name of the Lord. I am. See, that's what you do when most times when you cry for cars. There's nothing wrong with it. But have you checked with heaven? Let me show you something that will bring a balance that we are missing. There is no prosperity gospel you would have taught John the Baptist that we account to anything in his life. Because so long as the dictates of his ordination was concerned, he needed to be taught in the wilderness. So every time you bring John into abundance, you are robbing him of ordination. Now, it will be an error for John to come and say, everybody that wants to know God must be poor. That is witchcraft. According to the kind of ordination he has, the process for him was to be separated from pleasure and from humankind. The guy was going to look into the spirit realm and unravel prophecies until he reaches 700 years prophecy. There was no way distraction could be allowed, not even wealth. So when he showed up, they say, who are you? He didn't say, I am John. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. That guy had traveled from time. He knows the region of eternity. Why are you baptizing? The one that sent me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descend and rest is the Messiah. Who talks like that? Is a man of process. So prosperity gospel is not for John. The only gospel that is for John is the gospel of suffering. The Bible says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. That's a kind of the gospel. Jesus' life is a revelation of different dimensions of the dealings and operation of God. That's why the Bible called him the author and the finisher of our faith. So there's a kind of faith that accepts suffering as a training school. He said he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Meanwhile, another person can be destined for greatness, but he listened to poverty until he stepped out of ordination in a bid to please God because he thinks when you are suffering, you are pleasing God. Did you read about Lazarus? In Luke 16, when Lazarus went to heaven, the Bible says Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. That means in the generation of Lazarus, Lazarus was supposed to walk in the fullness of the Abrahamic blessing. So in heaven, he's in the lineage of Abraham. But unfortunately, when Lazarus was on earth, the Bible says he was a poor man. So the reason Lazarus was poor was not because that was part of his process. He was supposed to be rich, but maybe he had the gospel of suffering too much. So he blinded his eyes. It was when he went to heaven, he started enjoying. So, how do we balance it? When we teach, we teach prosperity as a standard. But in case you heard God and he said, go to the wilderness, there's nothing wrong with it. If you are sure you heard God. Every one of us will prosper. The Bible said, I wish above all things that thou mightest prosper and be in hell, even as your soul prospered. He said, tell them that are rich in this world to be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God that give it to every man liberally that they may enjoy. So prosperity is the will of God and it's, it's a cost to be poor. But there is a place in God where the dictates for your ordination demands that you go through suffering in order to achieve the mandate of your destiny. That is not a sin. 
So when you exercise faith, don't be zealous. Be revelational. You reign, you reign, you reign. You reign, you reign, you reign, God. Oh, you are mighty on your throne. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. They use that scripture erroneously. So when you stand before the sick, you say, I can do all things. Why? No, what Paul meant was different. Because he said, I have learned how to abound and to abase. I am Lord of circumstance. That means at some point in Paul's life, he went to the college of suffering. At some point in his life, he went to the college of wealth. So he knows the difference. And none of them moves him anymore. That's a tried stone. I'm Lord of circumstance. And if you check the gospel of Paul, he taught prosperity as a blueprint. But he knows suffering. That's ordination. Another thing process does is that it validates your calling. You will become fake if you are not a man of process. It may not be immediately, but not too long you will see it. Most of the prophets that you see today, they began genuinely with the spirit of righteousness. But they did not understand that in the prophetic corridor, there are two parts. There's a part of righteousness and there's a part of Balaam. Balaam was not a man of process. The Bible said, whoever he causes is cost. Whoever he blessed is blessed. When Balaam came to prophesy, he called himself a man that sees with his eyes open. So you can sense arrogance within his chambers. I, Belam, the son of Beowah, the man that sees with my eyes. Oh, that's not part of the job they called you for. Why is it important? No process. No process. They come to professor. They say, young man, listen, be very careful. I talk to governors. Don't waste my time here. Oh, God. They didn't ask the people you talk to. There's a challenge. They say, come as a prophet and handle it. But when you hear like that, no, there's no process. Watch them. After a while, after a while, they will go into the error of Bela. After a while, they will go into the way of Bela. Then they will go into the doctrine of Bela. They will begin to teach us at the writing. So they tell you it's boldness in Jesus. The last time we read the Bible, that was arrogance, not boldness. But they are not men of process. So even though they know they are prophets, they will never enter into the fullness of ordination. Process is one of the major things that validates your calling. Jesus showed up and John began to write. First, John said, before I am able to give you the credentials of this personality, I need to journey back into the beginning. Because you can't introduce him unless you have been granted access to the foundation, the credit of time. He said, in the beginning was the word. This is the personality he wants to introduce. The word was with God and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 5. He said, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He said in him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Four credentials that nobody before him ever had. All the prophets that live. Abraham, Elijah. None of them had those credentials. So Paul himself showed up. He said God who had sounded times and in diverse manners. Spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet. But has in this last day spoken unto us by his son. And then he said, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. This is the kind of posterior introduction they gave Jesus Christ. In John's introduction, there are four major things. One, he said he was the keeper of the gate of the beginning. That means time and creation owes his existence to him. Secondly, he said he was with God and he was God. That means everything you read about God, this man is God. Meanwhile, the Hebrew guy believes there is only one God and he is in heaven. How can a man show up and you say this is God? It's, it's blasphemy. You can be killed for it. But Jesus came and said this man is equivalent to the Elohim. And they didn't stop there. They said in case you have a hope of living for eternity, it is your fraternity with this man that we grant it to you. Because he said in him was life. 
the life was the light of men. In case you can never manifest anything about God, even if you did it before or you will do it in the future, it's still because of your fraternity with this man. That means there is nothing about God and creation that can exist apart from him. No wonder Paul came and said the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him bodily. But this same Jesus with the boisterous introduction, after he was introduced, as if that was not enough, he was coming to the Jordan River. And John stood up, John that everybody revered. Remember, there was no prophet in Israel for 400 years. It was called the age of darkness. So John was the first prophet that generation knew. Everything they read about prophets and the prophetic was defined by John in that generation. So they revered John like a god. Even the Pharisees came to John and he said, you go away, brood of vipers. You can't challenge John. He was a god in his generation. And then Jesus was strolling to the Jordan River and John stood up and said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Ah! When John speaks like that, the whole universe will turn their attention to you. It's just like they hold you on Facebook now and Donald Trump say, Fear this man. If this man go to any country, the president will be the one to receive him. Because you don't know what fear this man is. It could be that all the atomic bomb that US has, this is the man that creates it. Because you don't know. Because a mighty man say what? Fear this man. If that mighty man fear this man, then if you don't fear him, you are foolish. So when John pointed Jesus and say, now when you call the Lamb of God, it means all the prophecy before time and cause on him. So everything the Jewish people believe in is the one walking to him in bodily form. If you believe in resurrection, this is the resurrection. If you believe in healing, this is healing. If you believe in mercy, this is mercy. If you believe in power, this is power. Because everything about the prophet and the law, this is the man that is carrying it. And then this man shows up and then he came and knelt down before John. I don't understand what's happening. I thought they say you are creator. I thought they say you are the son of God. I thought they say you are God. I thought they say you are life. I thought they say you are the lamb. The man was going through process. When John said, no, no, no. You are, you, I should be baptized of you. He now said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I cannot manifest until I have gone through process. Manifestation is not something that is difficult for me. But for my manifestation to be accurate, I must go through process. The reason the sacrifice of Jesus was accepted was not because he rose from the dead. Even before he died, he was Lord. And he was Lord over death. But the reason his sacrifice was accepted was because it was perfect. That was why even after he rose from the dead, he said, touch me not. I have not ascended to the Father. If you defy my sacrifice, my resurrection will come for nothing. So he knew the power of process. Suffer it to be so for now. Does it become us to fulfill all righteousness? And the creator went down. Remember, he said for now because he was not violating the law of the spirit. So don't come to church tomorrow and say, um, Reverend, suffer it to be so for now. I'm led to impart you. <laughs> I know people. <laughs> the Bible said without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. That's the law of the spirit. But this man was going through process. So there was an exception created for him in order for him to become the mirror image that every humanity can look upon. So his life became the compass for us to study and to live accurately. A man without process is a dangerous man. Even though he is engraced by God, he's a risk to his generation. That's why you see most gifted people are most lawless. They think they hear God too. And they think it's about hearing God. For 100 years, Noah was functioning continuously by discernment of spirit. For one, he built the ark for 100 years, and including every nail that was nailed into that ark, he saw it in heaven. But when the immortals came, they didn't judge him by his discerning ability, they judged him by his reverence. You can be gifted, but when Jesus shows up, he will tell you, Away from me, you walker of iniquity. They say, We prophesied in your name, we casted out devil. Lord, I thought we are saved when we call him Lord. I thought the proof that we are saved is that we have gifts of the Spirit. He said, away from me, you walkers of iniquity. Men without process. So the very gift of God became the reason why they were disqualified. Every time you pray to God for blessings, make sure it does not violate your accuracy and alignment with God. The day blessings begin to affect your alignment with God, that blessing becomes a cause. 
This is what a lot of people are not taught. And then the craze for materiality begins to substitute spirituality. You think a man is spiritual because he has three cars. You are a joker. Go to heaven, they will surprise you. That in a whole generation, the most ranking man lived in the wilderness. In a whole generation, the most ranking man fed on honey and wild locusts. In the whole generation, the most ranking man was wrapped with camel skin. God doesn't judge prosperity by material possession. He judges prosperity by the degree that his word grows on your inside. If his word grows, it will tame your flesh and it will cause things to happen to you. When you look at the wrong things, your value systems will be wrong. And you may not have rank in Zion. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. You know why I'm sharing what I'm sharing? I want to troubleshoot your mind. Because some of you here are prophets. You wake up someday and it looks as if God wants you to go through a process for five years. And you don't understand, but you are thinking it's a sin. It's not right now. If I'm not, if I don't have a car at the age of 25, it's not good now. And we are men of God. When we come to preach, we will teach the standard of God, but we will not violate your dealing with God. I can't come to teach and say it is good to be poor. It will enslave a generation. Every time I preach, I will enforce prosperity, but your dealing with God is personal. That's why the root of the tree is not on top. It's under the ground. You don't see it. It's not for public visage. <laughs> you can draw a tree. You will not draw the root. The root is not for men. That one is in the chambers of your intimacy with God. You reign. You ancient Zion. Oh my God. We are out of time. There are remaining two. But ah, we can't teach it. We can't. We can't explain it. All the scriptures I wrote here, I'm not even quoting them. It's a button. So you see the way process validated Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 to 17, he gave him public validation. When he knelt down before John and he was baptized, the Bible said the heavens opened. And God speak. He said, this is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. You want God to announce it to your generation? Don't go on Facebook. Don't go on Twitter. Don't go on Instagram. Facebook don't announce men. It is the voice of spirits that announce men. He will thunder from heaven. And say, this is my son. At that time. Everybody will say there is something about you. You can come for the fellowship. You didn't leave prayer. But everybody is talking in their mind. Mm, if I before carried that microphone. They say, you have never seen him. But they say, this is my beloved son. Public validation. The second level of validation that God gave him because of process was heaven's empowerment. So as you grow in process, you will see this thing growing. There will be a time when you, you will know that you are an apostle. People will even start calling you an apostle, but there is no authority to back it. That time, your process level has reached a place where God can make people know you are an apostle. If you jump out that time and say, I am an apostle to the nation, you will set yourself up. After that was done, Jesus still followed. In Matthew 4 verse 1, the Bible said, the Holy Ghost led him to the wilderness to be tempted. There is another layer of process. And after he was tempted in the wilderness and he satisfied the claims of divine justice at that level, the Bible said in Matthew 4 16 that he returned in the power of the Spirit that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. They that sat in the shackles of death. You see, a great light is strong forth. If Jesus moved from Jordan to the synagogue, he would not have been the light. Because at that level of process, the world just knew him as the son of God. There's another level of process that brought heaven's empowerment. Most of us don't reach there. Because we came for the fellowship, everybody, you gave two words of knowledge. They now say, prophet, prophet, you now come up. The next, when they are talking, they are giving the mic, you just wait. The last time I went to Modern Market, uh -huh. <laughs> oh, 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 
This man is tempting me. Wait until you receive what? Heaven's empowerment is another level of validation. A lot of people don't travel that far. And then thirdly, it is the confirmment of authority for creation and nature to bow to you. Jesus was for 30 years in Nazareth. He never healed one sick person. He was announced the son of God. He never left to heal anybody. He went until he received heaven's empowerment. He came. He began to open blind eyes. In fact, at that point, he had the right to come and read his manifesto. He said, the spirit of God is upon me. For he has anointed me. Hey! If you doubt in that time, bring the blind man, the eye will open. If you doubt him, bring the lame, he will stand up. You may say, come on! Are you not Jesus the carpenter? A carpenter has become the light of the world. Process have redefined his morphology. You know, it's like metamorphosis. You may see a carpenter before he went to the mountain. When he came down, he's no longer a carpenter. He's a light. But it takes prophet, prophetic people to know. But after that time, the Bible went further. He was still living a life of government and prayer. Until in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1, the Bible said after eight days, he took Peter, James, and John to the mountain. There he prayed and the fashion of his countenance was altered. Then what happened was that the law and the prophets came to submit their testament to him. Because at that time, kingdom is about to hit the earth. All this while he was light. Now he's about to become an envoy of heaven. At that time, if Jesus moved, he's no longer a man, he's an embassy. So when he was walking on earth, he said, the son of man, which is in heaven. This time, it's no longer the law and prophets that were operating on earth, it's kingdom. And at that level, God said, this is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. But God didn't stop this time. He said, hear ye him. What happened the first time in the Jordan River? Why didn't God say, hear ye him? Process was not complete. It's not because God was running short of vocabulary. It is process that determines the degree to which God will speak to you. If you have not completely obeyed the instruction of yesterday, forget about the instruction of tomorrow. When you complete one level of obedience, then God speaks again. So here, ye him was now added. At that time, if Jesus speak, even the forces of nature will obey. He can command anything at his will. Process. He validates the ordination. The third thing is manifestation. When your process is completed, you become a theater through which we can see the dimensions of heaven. Remember, uh, Isaiah was the most profound messianic prophet, but he could not manifest that dimension. On earth, he was a prophet, but something happened in Isaiah chapter 6. He went to heaven. said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. And he said, his train filled the temple. After he saw the glories of God, instantly, Isaiah that was a national prophet, now reintroduced himself in heaven. Did you notice the change in introduction? On earth he was prophet, but when he went to heaven, he said, woe unto me. I am a man of an unclean lips. <laughs> that means everything Isaiah was saying was what? An utterance from a man of an unclean lips. They knew him as a prophet on earth, but in heaven he was what? A man of an unclean lips. Until one of the seraphims took one of the coals and touched his tongue. When Isaiah returned in verse 9, he said, A virgin shall be with child. A virgin shall be with child. There was no way he could give expression to the messianic prophecy because he was a man of unclean lips. When your process is not complete, the weight of your ordination can never manifest. You will see mercy drop here and there. You will call yourself names like a joker. I am a man. When God touched him, his re-blend began to manifest. A virgin shall be with child and his name shall be called Emmanuel. He shall be called Mighty One, Counselor. He said the government of this world shall be upon his shoulder. From the one, he was the messianic prophet. But he didn't have all chance or manifestation. It's when your process is complete that you can handle glory. The Bible said, when the Lord shall build up Zion, then he shall appear in his glory. Most times what we see are mercy drops to give us assurance that we are called. 
God told me he will open doors for me to travel around. So that I will master the use of my tools. It's not because I have become a full-blown apostle. Process. Many never complete process. So what they have is called false manifestation. And that's what destroys a lot of young men. False manifestation. The guy gave his heart to Christ on campus. Now he's 400 level. He said God has called him to go and pastor a church. How many years have you been trained? Jesus was educating the doctors of the law at the age of 12. He became a prophet to the nation at the age of 30. That means Jesus went through process for 18 years. And that is for the weight of his calling. Somebody came to Christ in two years. He said, he's, he's, he's going. Maybe your calling is for one and a half month. <laughs> so it's possible you can. <laughs> if it is the nations, then you can't move until your training is complete. Even when they are pushing you out, you will wait. Because you know that when you saw that vision, you saw the globe. You can't afford to make error on the scene. It will be king size error. So it's better you make error in your father's house. That place you can be covered. A guy says it's pastor. Meanwhile, this is the same guy that touched the lady and the pastor did counseling with them for six months and gathered them together. After one year, he now says he, he's been called. Meanwhile, that lost has not even been tamed. Where you will make that error, it will be king size error and you will never fulfill the mandate of your destiny anymore. Manifestation. A function of completed process. A man without process will have no manifestation that heaven can validate. You may go to heaven and you'll be a man of unclean lips. Jesus can appear to you and tell you, I've made you an apostle. It's not a lie, you, but your process must be completed. He said, when your obedience is complete, you can avenge other disobedience. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, he said, for them, for them, oh my God, these are one of my, my most, they are scriptures you love. You know, as Jeremiah said, I found a word, I did eat them, and it became the joy and the rejoicing of our heart. He said, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, so he also himself became a partaker of the same, that through death he may destroy him that have the power over death, even the devil. He said that he may deliver them who through fear of death was all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus paid that price. But when you give your heart to Christ, how much of it are you manifesting? That means without process, you can't enter into the fullness of ordination. The price has been paid. But to walk it, you must carry your cross. And finally, it's what we call reckoning. The first one is born in eternity past. The second two are born on earth. The last one is born in eternity future. That's why outside of Christ there's no security. Your vision came from eternity past. Process and manifestation is in time, but reckoning is in eternity future. So after you do everything you do in time, your report card is not on earth. Your report card is in heaven. That's why Paul said, walk out your salvation with what? With fear and trembling. I have no, you, you don't have the right to be proud about what you are doing. Because you can finish doing it and there is no score in Zion. So every time you do it, you do it at the mercy of grace. Many people don't have understanding of reckoning. So they think it's about what happens on the altar. They walk like this. God is good. I have raised uh, 1,000 children and yesterday, uh, this shoe I'm wearing is 50,000. That's what the apostle told them. The glory. He thinks is their uh, honorarium he received that is his value. You can receive honorarium for a lifetime, but there's no score for you in heaven. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, he said, Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Having received a kingdom, that cannot, that means the standard of God standeth sure. It doesn't shake or bend for any man. This is why we do what we do with fear. And we call, it would have cost me nothing to come here and preach and wow you and go away. But I pray to you this morning. Because it's not about oratorial power. It's not even about the manifestation in the hall. It's about alignment with Zion. 
It was around 6.15 in the morning that this message came to me. And I quickly began to write. I began to write. He looked at me, he laughed. Because he knows that some of my messages on the altar, I receive it. So when we come and we sing one song, we are singing another song. It's not because that day the anointing for worship is on us. No. We are, we are asking for mercy. You see, man of God, singing and lifting holy hands. That guy is asking for mercy. He doesn't, he doesn't have what to tell you. Because we are not theologians. We are witnesses. There's nothing wrong in being a theologian. But we are sent to bring Jesus to the scene. So that as many as see him shall become like him. Because he said, when we shall see him, we shall be like him. Reckoning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5. The Bible says, judge nothing before it's time. Until God makes manifest the counsel of the heart. Then he shall give to every man. He say, I the Lord. Jeremiah 17 verse 11. I try the reins to give unto every man as his way should be. Don't stop your journey at the level of vision. You will be a proud man and you will waste. Don't stop your journey at the level of process. You will be accurate with heaven, but you cannot bless humanity. Don't stop your journey at the level of manifestation. You may bless humanity, but you have no place in Zion. Stop your journey at the level of reckoning. So that when the white throne appears, when you go there, you will not receive judgment, but you will receive inheritance. For you, the white throne will become a mercy seat. Where you come boldly to receive your inheritance in God. Every one of us was fabricated by the boisterous intelligence of God in order to fulfill an eternal mandate that is consistent with building the new Jerusalem that should appear at the end of all things. What is your part? To what degree are you preparing yourself to fulfill it? And to what extent will you fulfill it when you bow your head and you are ferried through the portals of the great divide into the regions of light? What will be your testimony in heaven? It was in Hebrews chapter 11 that we saw that the stories of men are not stored on earth. That was when we knew that what we call biography is a joke. Even autobiography is a joke. The destinies of men are read out. Their citations are read out on the eternal corridors of Zion. That's when you will be shocked that everything you do, God may not count it. It's only one thing God was looking at in your life. I told you about, about Noah that was built in by discernment of spirit. But when they were reading his citation in heaven, they said Noah feared God. Noah feared God alone was enough for him to be true and true. When they came to Abel, they said Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He said by it, even after he was dead, his blood was speaking from the ground. So the language that heaven recognized concerning Abel in heaven was not his good looks. It was not even his service. It was the sacrifice that Abel gave that resonated in Zion. He came to Abraham and he calculated all his life in one sentence, a man of faith. He said he was looking for a city with foundation whose maker and builder is God. I thought the Bible said Abraham was rich and, and stricken in age and the God, God had blessed him in all things. That one is citation among men. Citation in the angelic realm. Silver and gold is not counted. It's obedience that they saw concerning Abraham. When they came to Moses, a prophet that could decree and the ground opened his mouth and swallowed men of disobedience in heaven. They said when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pledges that was in Egypt for a season. He said, for he saw him that was invincible. He had no regard for pleasure, but for the recompense of the reward. So because Moses lived his life for reward in heaven, he was marked righteous. What is the story that will be told concerning you in the day of reckoning? This is why we live in time as strange creatures. For Swarume will say, your life is a story. That God is telling from heaven. What will be said concerning you when you appear in Zion? Bow your heads and pray. We are out of time. Usually this is the time where I begin to fly. But we don't have the time. I know this is church. This is not revival meeting. This is not camp meeting. So we are constrained. Talk to Jesus. You may not have had a vision. 
You may not have been submitted to process. Your process may not have been completed while you are praying for manifestation. And you may even be manifesting now, but you have lost days of Zion. So you don't know there's a day of reckoning. The Bible said, I saw a white throne appear, and books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Another book was open. Books of service, book of life, they were open. So that God can give to every man as his ways should be. Beauty will count for nothing. There's a place where it is the eternities of God. When the ends of eternity are open, what will they matter? Say about your life. That's the quality of life that you live. It doesn't matter anymore. On earth you can be an apostle, but in heaven, Jesus said, They that overcome, I will plant them in the courts of my father as a tree of life. I will give them a white stone that no man know it. And upon that white stone, but in heaven, you may be an overcomer. What is the story that will be told concerning you? When the battle lines of the of the eternities are open, and the things that are rooted in the restraints of Zion. This is where the relevance of men are drawn from. We are standing for the next five minutes. There is something I will do this morning. I want to place a demand on the apostolic office. So that Zion will open for someone this morning. And for the first time, you will draw your reference from eternity. There's a place where God uses men to teach men. But there's a place when the Holy Ghost himself becomes your teacher. I want to make a demand on heaven. We will pray in tongues for five minutes. I don't have time now to flow so long. But when we are done praying, I will make certain things happen by the apostolic authority. And... Hear me, I say this with all humility in God. These are the bodies the Lord has put in my heart this morning. So that somebody will begin to serve with a different orientation. We'll pray in tongues for five minutes. Go ahead and ask the Lord to bring you an encounter that will change your story. And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is touched, it will be purged. When you come back, you can become a prophet.